After a major speech in the Armenian parliament by Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan regarding the Karabakh issue and a peace treaty with Azerbaijan, many Armenian observers have raised the alarm and are concerned that Armenia may be preparing to cede control over Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan. I'm joined now by Civilnet contributor Digran Krikorian to discuss this and more. So Digran, thank you again for your time. Thank you for having me. You penned an article which is available in English and Armenian on the Civilnet website titled An Era of Peace Will Come Alongside the Ethnic Cleansing of Armenians of Artsakh. Regarding Pashinyan's speech, which you detail a lot in the article, the PM stated that the international community is telling Armenia to lower the bar when it comes to the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. He also said the Armenian government should move focus from the status of Nagorno-Karabakh to the rights of the Armenians in Artsakh. Uh, what did you think when you saw this speech? And do you agree with many observers that there is a possibility that Armenia is preparing to cede control to Azerbaijan? Uh, yeah, so this speech is the pinnacle of a process that started months ago, probably in summer 2021. Uh, Pashinyan's position at the moment is very clear. Uh, when he's talking about lowering the bar, it means that the Armenian government is ready to accept the political status of Nagorno-Karabakh within uh, the Azerbaijani jurisdiction. Um, although it is a bit more nuanced that uh, certain observers and commentators are trying to present it, so it's not that uh, Armenia is ready um, to agree to a um, for example, cultural autonomy status within the Azerbaijani uh, borders. And at this point, it seems that uh, that is the maximum uh, Baku is ready to seat, uh, some sort of cultural autonomy. So Armenia is going to negotiate about some sort of political status within the Azerbaijani uh, jurisdiction, which is also problematic because as soon as an agreement comes into force, which like defines a certain even political status within the Azerbaijani border. Uh, people uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh, the Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, will just leave the territory on a voluntary basis. And uh, that would be a tragedy. Mm. And you speak in great deal uh, about European actors and EU actors throughout this process. So can you tell us about this process and why their involvement is so important? I think this process started in June 2021, uh, right after the snap parliamentary elections in Armenia. Uh, in the time span between the parliamentary elections and the adoption of the government's program, a number of European dele delegations uh, visited the region. And uh, even the public message they were giving to the Armenian government was that uh, the Armenian authorities should concentrate, should focus on the democratic development and modernization of Armenia. Um, and uh, the second part of this statement, which wasn't always announced uh, or stated, was that Armenia should probably ab abandon some of its positions on the Karabakh issue because in their understanding that uh, these positions were maximalist, especially uh, in the aftermath uh, of the Second Karabakh War, during which um, Armenia lost and Armenia was the losing side. So it was uh, some sort of an uh, attempt to establish a victor's peace in the region. And in return, the EU was offering Armenia a significant, significant package of financial and economic support and prospects of economic development and so on. So this process lasted probably for two months. And uh, the last visit, visit was the visit of the uh, president of the European Council uh, to, the, to the region and to Yerevan, Charles Michel. And uh, that is the point when the EU mediation in the Armenian Azerbaijani context started. Uh, so, to give our viewers an understanding of what happened uh, in this time frame, uh, the ruling party, the civil contract party, participated in the SNAP parliamentary elections with a very bold agenda on the Karabakh issue. If you read their, uh, uh, the, the Karabakh section of their uh, party platform uh, during the SNAP parliamentary elections, they were talking about remedial secession for Nagorno-Karabakh, about the impossibility of Nagorno-Karabakh being part of Azerbaijan. 
uh, about uh, the occupation of uh, certain territories occupied by Azerbaijan during uh, the 44-day war. Uh, mainly, uh, they were talking about uh, the territories of the former Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast, like Hadrut and Shushi. Uh, they were clearly stating that Armenia is still the guarantor of security of the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, so after the elections, um, as a result of this uh, EU mediation, if you can call it a, some sort of mediation, uh, they completely changed their position. And in the government program, which was adopted in August 2021, all these points, all these aforementioned points were like uh, left aside and very mitigated position on Karabakh was adopted in the government program. And from that point on, uh, the government starting, started a process of normalization of the idea that Nagorno-Karabakh could be, uh, potentially could be a uh, part of Azerbaijan. Different government officials, different MPs were giving interviews saying, you know, the most important thing is the pre preservation of the Armenian population in Nagorno-Karabakh. We should, uh, that, sh that should be our goal and so on. But the problem with all these statements was that uh, they were contradicting themselves. If the, if the end goal was to uh, preserve the Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh in place, then any status within the Azerbaijani borders uh, would entail um, just uh, the opposite outcome. People, as I already mentioned, uh, would just leave. And I, I don't know whether it's, uh, there is a problem with the understanding of this uh, crucial point or they are just dishonest in their uh, statement. So this process went on and one of the pinnacles of this process was the December press conference of the Prime Minister where he basically used some of the most popular Azerbaijani arguments and um, perceptions about the conflict to justify this shift in Armenia's position and to prepare uh, the general public uh, in Armenia uh, for the incoming processes in the negotiation process. And the April uh, 13th speech was another pinnacle of this process. And when Pashinyan straightforwardly says things which were like unimaginable months ago and especially uh, the, uh, the the MPs from the ruling parties uh, when they were like giving speeches in the National Assembly on the next day uh, the level of manip manipulation and the level of I don't know how even to, to call it was like absolutely amazing. Mm. And this is another thing some people don't understand. Uh, Pashinyan uh, would say very often before the war that any solution to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict has to be acceptable to the people of Armenia, Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh. But after this uh, speech, Nagorno-Karabakh's parliament and government has, has openly challenged. And um, my question is, if Yerevan makes such an agreement, doesn't it need Stepan Akert's approval as well? Well, obviously, lots of people in the decision-making circles of uh, Armenia don't think so. Uh, the, for the formula you mentioned was a populist formula, which didn't imply anything that, yeah, okay, you can say nice things about the uh, settlement process, but if you are not offering concrete plans or concrete steps for the settlement, and it's just another act of populism. So after the war, we see that he abandoned this Kind of populist approach and is trying to be more rational and he's trying to um, substantiate his claims and his approaches with rational uh, arguments uh, but as i said uh, these arguments might be rational but the end result of these policies will be uh, the depopulation of nagorno-karabakh and it is quite natural that such kind of reaction is coming from Stepan Akert. I mean, it is clear for all the people living in Nagorno-Karabakh, for the decision making makers, for the ordinary people, that if this process um, reaches its um, logical end, then that will be the end of Nagorno-Karabakh as we know it.
At the same time, we recently spoke about the International Re Republican Institute and their poll findings in Armenia, which found that an overwhelming majority of the Armenian public would not accept Azerbaijani rule over Nagorno-Karabakh. So how can the government abandon a policy which has over 95% approval? And wouldn't that spell political chaos in Armenia proper, in Yerevan? Well, that's one of the issues with this, um, uh, with this um, recently announced policy of the government and with all these statements coming from the MPs, they say that there is a public consensus um, on the peace agenda in Armenia. Uh, they do not uh, clearly define what is this p peace agenda and, it, and they didn't de clearly define this peace agenda uh, during the snap parliamentary elections. As we've, as we've already discussed, uh, they participated with one agenda and then changed the agenda after the elections. Well, for example, uh, Lena Nazarian, who is an MP from the ruling party, says, I, I, I understood that there is a public consensus on the peace agenda during my conversations with different groups uh, of people in Armenia. Like, this is, this is ridiculous. How can you uh, judge about public consensus, uh, consensus uh, based on private conversations with different groups? And the IRI uh, poll results say, say the opposite. The Armenian public is not ready uh, to accept the solutions they are uh, offering. Uh, I don't know about the possible a reaction of the general public because there is an, this atmosphere of apathy uh, in Armenia. People are very passive. People do not want to get engaged in any political process. I don't know whether uh, there will be an active opposition to these policies, uh, but the claim that there is a public consensus um, on the peace agenda uh, and what is the peace agenda in general is a clear manipulation by the uh, government officials and uh, 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 MPs of the ruling party. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested what you think about Russia's role in all of this. Obviously, Russian peacekeepers are stationed in Nagorno-Karabakh. Since the war, Armenia's dependence on Russia has increased. What do you think Moscow thinks about this process? Uh, it's very hard to say what Moscow thinks. Um, you could argue that Moscow is not interested in any um, final settlement of this issue because that would uh, lead uh, to to the eventual uh, to, to, to the eventual exit of the Russian forces from at least Nagorno Karabakh. So you would you would think that they they could probably oppose that. But taking into consideration the situation in Ukraine, when Russia uh, faces like lots of challenges and problems, and Russia's attention is probably uh, uh, more focused on the on the developments in Ukraine. Uh, probably the uh, people who are behind this plan uh, think that this is the right moment, right opportunity when Russia distracted with the war in Ukraine to pursue with this with this policy and without much opposition from Russia. But that's still uh, that's still a question mark. We still need to wait and see what uh, Russia's, uh, Russia's reaction. I would like to talk about. Another assumption which has been uh, circulated in, in the public discourse in Armenia that, you know, Armenia has nothing to do with Nagorno-Karabakh. It's now a Russian protectorate. Russia is in charge and so on. Uh, in, in my understanding, this is a very naive claim because Armenia still uh, provides lots of financial support to the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. Without Armenian support, people in Nagorno, like the Nagorno-Karabakh, a republic wouldn't even exist because Russia is not providing any assistance. Russia is just has just stations, uh, stationed its uh, military in Nagorno-Karabakh, and that's it. There is no other Russia, other type of Russian involvement, Russian involvement in Nagorno-Karabakh. That's the first point. The second point: Russia is not interested in in preserving uh, some sort of Armenian statehood in Nagorno-Karabakh. All Russia wants is uh, military presence there. And military presence can be secured by having an insignificant number of uh, people still living there, let's say 30,000, 40,000. So if you are saying, OK, Armenia is abandoning its position, but there's still Russia who is interested in certain things. Russia is not interested in 
Ar in, in protecting Armenia's interests or the interests of the Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh, Russia is interested in promoting its own interests. So uh, that's not a uh, proper point. Uh, but yeah, Russia's role probably will be crucial. We've seen that uh, the uh, OSCE Ms. Group co-chair, the Russian OSCE Ms. Group co-chair, uh, was appointed as uh, the foreign minister's uh, special representative uh, for the uh, in the negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan, I think that's um, that's an echo coming from from the early 90s. We remember that uh, during the first Karabakh War, Russia was engaged both in the Minsk Group process and was represented in the Minsk Group process by the ambassador uh, Kazimirov. And Kazimirov was also the special representative of the president of uh, the Russian Federation in the. Uh, in the Karabakh process. So there is some sort of return to the roots of the mediation process. Mm -hmm. And finally, Tigran, the parliamentary opposition says that Pashinyan is threatening that there will be a new war if concess concessions aren't made. At the same time, on the other side, there are those that say, isn't it better that there be a treaty compared to a third war? But these are real fear tactics. In a sense, it's causing alarm amongst the Armenian population. So what do you think about these narratives being uh, thrown back and forth by the government and the opposition? I think uh, the opposition delegitimizes even very legitimate ideas and very legitimate concerns by, by, by mere existence. Like, even if you are taking the most like legitimate, the most rightful cause, which would be supported, could be supported by the majority of the population, and give it to the opposition, it's, it's the end of it. Like the, the society of Armenia is not ready to accept any ideas coming from the opposition. And they are part of the problem. Both the government and the opposition are part of the problem. And they actually enable each other by... So I don't have any hopes with the current parliamentary opposition. I don't think they are, they, they are capable of stopping the government policy, uh, the newly adopted policy, or not newly adopted policy, because we said it was adopted six months ago. Uh, I think some sort of societal mobilization is needed. People who are really concerned people who are realistic in their expectations, people who are not using slogans in this issue, who are ready to bring rational counter-arguments arguments, uh, to the position of, of, of the government of Armenia. Because if we follow the logic of the government, Armenia has no resources to even exist. Because taking into account the existential challenges we have, challenges we have Armenia should just must just seek to see, to exist because after this issue the issue of the corridor will, will come what what will be the reaction of the armenian government are we seeing that as well after that maybe russia will try to incorporate armenia into the its union state has armenia certain resources to oppose uh, russia's efforts i don't think so if if you are going Moving forward with this logic, you just need to need to immigrate from here because Armenia doesn't have resources according to their logic. But politics is not like that. It's not uh, done like that. First of all, you need to define your position. You need to define your red lines, and you need to start searching for different solutions. And all the solutions are not military. We understand that militarily we are in a very weakened position after the war. But there are also diplomatic options. If the international community has a certain position on this issue at this moment, it doesn't mean that position cannot be changed. Uh, I, I'm bringing this as example all the time. The international community uh, clearly declared in the uh, Lisbon, Lisbon summit of uh, 1996, the OSCE summit, that uh, the issue the Karabakh issue should be resolved within the borders of Azerbaijan, within the, uh, within the territorial integrity principle and so on. And that was the international principle, international perce perception in 1996. But 10 years later, uh, the same international community, the OSC Ms. Group co-chairs, uh, put on, a ta on the negotiating, negotiating, uh, negotiation table a set of principles which clearly 
uh, fix the right of the Nagorno-Karabakh to self-determination and fix the mechanism of self-determination. Now, I'm not saying that the Madrid principles are still relevant or we can still use it and so on. I'm just showing that these international perceptions uh, are actually changing with time. And if you have a clear position, if you are ready to work, if you are ready to uh, explain all these points to our international partners that uh, okay, you want peace in this region, but this, the, the, the collateral damage of this era of peace in our region will be the complete depopulation of a territory, an ancient territory with, with an amazing cultural and historical background. If you work on a daily basis, trying to explain to your international partners these very important points, maybe their perception would also change with time. Also, I think that it is very imprudent to move forward with some sort of settlement process amid the Ukraine crisis. I mean, you don't even know what will be the situation in the world after the war in Ukraine, what will be the uh, geopolitical configuration, and you are already making conclusions uh, and trying to uh, uh, swiftly come to decisions that might be like fateful for an entire population. That's not very prudent. Okay, well, Digran, thank you again for your time. Thank you for inviting me. And continue following Civil Net.